Okay, that's it. Okay, looks like we are live. Um, welcome everyone to our July edition, a week late of the Radical Philosophy Hour. So happy to have you joining us today. Um, I think we got a really interesting and exciting uh, conversation for you today. Um, and in fact, today we're gonna to be hearing from our own Sarah Vitali, and uh, she is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. She teaches classes on critical theories, existentialism and social institutions. Her research focuses on Marx and post-Marxism, especially on notions of production, labor and human nature, as well as the scholarship of teaching and learning. Her recent publications include Beyond Homo Laborans, uh, somebody should teach me to speak Latin, by the way, so I can I can say these things correctly. Marx's dialectical account of human essence and post-Marxist political ontology and the foreclosure of radical newness. Um, she's also the co-coordinator uh, of the Radical Philosophy Association, along with me, and the co-organizer of the Radical Philosophy Hour, as well as director of the Philosophy Outreach Project, which promotes philosophy in high schools. And I should say, uh, Sarah is an activist in almost every every understanding of the term. So goodness knows how she finds the time to do it all. We, we are also joined happily by Charles Prusik. Uh, Charles is an instructor, uh, instructor of philosophy at Birmingham Southern College. He received his PhD in philosophy in 2017 from Villanova, and his research specializes in critical theory and political economy. He is the author of the recent Adorno and Neoliberalism, the Critique of Exchange Society through Bloomsbury Publishing. We are very happy to be joined by Charles today. Um, just a heads up before we get started, um, we will be having um, an upcoming um, uh, Radical Philosophy Hour in August. It'll be the first Monday, again, the first Monday of August. And we'll be joined by Tiffany Montoya from uh, Muhlenberg College, who will be talking to us about which side are you on, the class consciousness of punk. And we'll also be joined by Patrick D. Anderson, who is at Central State University. And he'll be talking about cynics to the front, punk rock's ancient roots. So essentially, uh, we'll have a really exciting program for you around uh, punk rock, its origins, and its philosophical significance in August. So please join us for that. Another final announcement I want to be sure and make is to, uh, uh, if you're going to, if you're interested and have the time, please do submit for our upcoming uh, Radical Philosophy Association conference. You can find information for the conference at radicalphilosophyassociation.org. That's radicalphilosophyassociation.org. Um, there's a really exciting conference theme. It's also the uh, 40th anniversary of the Radical Philosophy Association itself. So many great and exciting things happening that'll be taking place uh, at the University of North Florida. And the deadline is actually coming up very shortly. It's on July 15th. So be sure and get that to us soon. All right, so with all that said, now I wanna go ahead and turn it over uh, to Sarah and Charles. And they're gonna be talking to us today about Marxist feminism and questions of gender, value, and intersectionality. With that said, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and defer. I don't know, we didn't discuss, I should have asked who's going first. Is it Sarah or Charles? We're actually gonna go every other word. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, sounds good, sounds, sounds good. I'll be, we'll see how it works. No, um, Charlie and I um, are presenting um, a paper that we've written together. Um, so I'm going to speak for a little while um, and then Charlie will. Anyway, thank you for that uh, great introduction, Brandon, and so efficient. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, Charlie and I are um, presenting a project that we've been working on for a while, but still seems to be in its early stages. Um, and um, we're excited to be doing it in this venue because we really want uh, feedback. And so um, we'll be um, hoping to have uh, plenty of time for conversation at the end. So our presentation is titled Marxist Feminism, Gender, Value, and Intersectionality. And can you all see my, st my screen? Okay. Marxist feminists have attempted various ways to understand the relationship between patriarchy and capitalism. One way of dividing the approaches is into the categories of dual and single systems theories. In the first, capitalism is thought to create one type of oppression and patriarchy another. 
So the other set of approaches sees capitalism and patriarchy as part of the same system and as phenomena which cannot be properly understood apart from one another. In what follows, we will briefly discuss dual systems theories before examining two single systems theories in more detail, the wages for housework movement and what we call social reproduction theory. We obviously didn't um, coin that term, but while wages for housework is a theory of social reproduction, we distinguish it from what Susan Ferguson calls Marxian social reproduction theory. Against the wages for housework thinkers, we agree with the social reproduction theorists that reproductive labor is not value producing. Then we consider intersectionality as a possible version of a single systems theory. Intersectionality, which arose around the same time as the wages for housework movement and Marxian social reproduction theory, cautions us to avoid class reductionism or the dual systems inclination to see sexism, racism, classism, et cetera, as distinct systems. However, we argue that intersectionality does not seem to make good on its promise to interrogate the interrelation of various forms of oppression, at least when it comes to gender and class, because first it fails to distinguish between exploitation and oppression, and two, it does not provide a genetic account of the objects of its analysis. To achieve a Marxist feminist analysis that avoids both feminist idealism, which sees patriarchy as attitudinal or subjective, or and reductive materialist Marxism, which treats sexism as a tool of class oppression, we argue that we should turn to value dissociationism, dissociate dissociationism, which we discuss in the final part of the presentation. Briefly, duals, um, dual systems feminists typically hold that patriarchy preceded capitalism and continues to act as the primary form of oppression. Some hold that capitalist classes are in fact developments from or new forms of the sexual division of labor. A criticism often made by dual systems theorists, as Heidi Hartman argued in her 1979 text, The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism, is that Marxist analysis has dominated feminist analysis. She argues that our society, quote, can best be understood once it is recognized that it is organized both in capitalist and patriarchal ways, end quote, requiring different lenses to understand and critique these aspects of our society. There are at least two problems with dual systems theories. First, many, if not most, share an ahistorical notion of sexual difference. As they take patriarchy to be something that preceded capitalism, something that's existed over different epochs and cultural boundaries, what they call patriarchy is a monolith. They fail to recognize that each epoch has its own gender order, and to speak of gender in general obfuscates more than it clarifies. In addition, even if gender did predate capitalism, Cinzia Rutza, in a critique of dual systems theory, holds that we cannot say that gender oppression today is independent from capitalism. Because of how capitalism organizes our lives, gender relations today are inextricable from capitalist relations. In addition, empirical evidence of egalitarian societies also belies the argument that gender oppression is transhistorical. In response to dual systems theories, other Marxist feminists have tried to provide a unified theory to account for gender relations as they appear in capitalism, recognizing that capitalism and patriarchy are inextricable and cannot be thought, much less attacked, apart from each other. Single systems theorists typically do not believe we can turn to Marxist texts, though, for that unified system. They respond to what many consider a lacuna in Marx's work the absence of the discussion of gender. To summarize his theory briefly, Marx argues that labor power produces the value of commodities. This production of commodity values by labor, however, is never an individual act, but instead a social relation between capitalists and wage laborers orient towards the production of surplus value. Marx specifies that the determination of value is, quote, socially necessary labor time, um, 
that is the quote, labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent in that society. That is, he specifies the determination of value as socially necessary labor time. And this is one definition he offers. Labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent in that society, end quote. The expenditure of human labor in the abstract then is the value producing substance of capitalist wealth. However, Marx refers little to gender in his analysis of commodity production. In an oblique way, he discusses work typically performed by women when he explains that labor power, the capacity of the laborer to work, and the very commodity they sell each day to the capitalist must be reproduced. He has little to say, however, about how it is reproduced, save that it will involve, quote, natural needs such as clothing, fuel, and housing that differ according to geography, and so-called necessary requirements that he tells us are indeed products of history. Marxist feminists have held, by and large, that the attention he pays to the reproduction of labor power is insufficient, and that by sidestepping reproductive or domestic labor, Marx contributes to and perpetuates an overall tendency to devalue and ignore the work and contribution of women. One tradition that has tried to expand Marxist theory of labor to the role of women's work is wages for housework. The wages for housework movement began in Italy in the early 70s, growing out of the Italian workerist movement. In their 1971 pamphlet, The Power of Women and the Subversion of the Community, Maria Rosa Dalla Costa and Selma James turn their attention from the factory and the production of commodities to what Mario Tronti has called the social factory, the actual creation of workers and the creation of society itself. Dalla Costa and James created a new term for work that takes place outside the traditional economic sphere, reproductive labor. Reproductive labor includes, among other things, the reproductive activities of housework, these activities that must be performed over and over again so that the household and labor power can be reproduced. The wages for housework feminists attempted to show that reproductive labor, not merely abstract labor, creates value for the capitalist. Distinguishing their project from Marx's, James and Dalla Costa write, quote, we have to make clear that within the wage, domestic work produces not merely used values, but is essential to the production of surplus value, end quote. Silvia Federici also justifies the demand for wages for housework on the premise that, quote, housework is already money for capital, that capital has made and makes money out of our cooking, smiling, fucking, end quote. Federici later claims that what was revolutionary about the wages for housework thinkers was precisely their discovery that, quote, unpaid labor is not extracted by the capitalist class only from the waged workday, but it's also extracted from the workday of millions of unwaged houseworkers, as well as many other unpaid and unfree laborers, end quote. Federici explains how this works by appeal to the, quote, fact that those who produce, the producers of value, must be themselves productive of that value. The goal of wages for housework was to expose the free labor that women had performed for capital and mobilize these women into class struggle. They believe that privileging productive labor makes it seem that the male proletariat alone comprises the revolutionary class and women have no role in it. Other social reproduction theorists argue that domestic labor is central to capitalism, though not through creating value. Rather, they believe that reproductive or domestic labor benefits capitalism, quote, by reducing the value of labor power. Nancy Holmstrom argues that reproductive or domestic labor is necessary, produces use values, dinner at home, something like this, clothes for your children that you might make, and contributes, quote, to the production of surplus value. But while it doesn't produce surplus value, it facilitates the capitalist's ability to do so. 
Social reproduction theorists point out that the worker need not pay for all his means of subsistence, since women create much of them for free. They perform services that otherwise male workers would have to purchase on the market, laundering of clothes, making of meals, etc. So as we have seen, the two types of single systems theories that we've discussed diverge on the question of value, specifically whether reproductive labor is productive of value. While Federici and others make compelling arguments, when they speak of value, we believe they're describing something different than what Marx means by value and that this is an important difference. And more than that, while they can demonstrate that reproductive labor has an important role and even reduces the cost of labor power, they cannot demonstrate that it is creative of value. It's something that they postulate rather than prove. Intersectionality is another approach that often looks at the connection between patriarchy and capitalism. Ashley Bohr in Marxism and Intersectionality argues that though intersectional feminists and Marxists have been critical of one another, Marxism and intersectionality have much to offer one another. Also, insofar as intersectionality attempts to think the interrelation of various systems like classism and sexism, um, in a way they argue is not additive, which would be to consider classism and sexism as autonomous systems with different objects, intersectionality might be considered a single systems theory. Intersectionality was created by black feminists who argued that the discourses of feminism and anti-racism were ill-equipped to understand, for instance, the experience of black women. They argue that for anti-racism, the ideal victim of oppression has been the black man. And for feminism, the ideal victim of oppression has been the white woman. To understand that, consider the phrase women and people of color. Separating women and people of color presumes that the first category, women, is distinct from the second category, people of color. Therefore, women must be white and people of color black. Intersectionality theorists diagnose this problem, the erasure of the experience of black women throughout society and in legal writing, philosophy and the news and many other areas. The intersectional approach argues that we cannot understand the experience of black women through this additive analysis. To do so, we would be assuming that black women suffer from racism just like black men do and suffer from sexism in the same way white women do. Instead, intersectionality theorists argue black women suffer from racism and sexism in an altogether different way. And that's because the intersection of racism and sexism creates a new phenomenon. So insofar as intersectionality sees multiple oppressions as inextricably linked, as even unthinkable apart from one another, the experience of a disabled woman say is not the same as the experience of a disabled man plus the experience of a woman or the experience of the Muslim immigrant is not the same as the experience of a Muslim plus the experience of an immigrant and so on. It would seem to be offering this unified theory or at least an approach that demands we not look at one form of oppression as existing in a vacuum apart from other forms. But while intersectionality transcends the false universalism of traditional Marxism and their masculinist subject, the industrial proletariat, it frequently fails to move beyond empirical or sociological understandings of gender and class, at least. Intersectionality sees class, race, and gender as parallel identity categories, conceptualizing capitalist domination, as an intersection between identity-based oppressions fails to grasp the, spec the specificity of the abstract domination imminent to capital, namely the process of mediated and impersonal domination. In so doing, intersectionality also fails to distinguish between exploitation and oppression. Exploitation for Marx occurs when surplus value is extracted from the working class. Exploitation is at the heart of value creation and occurs during production. Labor power is the special commodity that creates more value than it is worth. That is, the worker creates more value than they receive in wages. The shorter the period of necessary labor in the day, the time it takes the worker to make enough value to cover the costs of their wages, the greater the rate of exploitation. 
To borrow Marilyn Fry's definition, oppression, on the other hand, occurs when a person, because of their membership in a group, is systematically denied choices available to others. Fry uses the analogy of a bird cage to explain oppression. If you look at one wire on the cage, you might think the bird should just fly over it or under it. But if you pan out, you see that there are many wires that are working together to constrain the bird's movement. A key difference between exploitation and oppression is that exploitation occurs in a free and fair exchange. Marx tells us that the worker is paid the value of his labor power, which is determined by the cost of the means of, of his subsistence. Oppression, on the other hand, is direct and deliberate, and one party does not consent. They are denied freedom exercised by other parties. It's true that Marx pays little attention to oppression. However, that's because his goal is to provide a critique of political economy. He did recognize how oppression occurred in feudalism. The serfs were not free to work at another fiefdom, uh, for example. And Marx would not deny that oppression takes place under capitalism. Intersectionality theorists, however, seem to approach class only in terms of classism, which is a form of oppression, but not the same as class exploitation. Patricia Hill Collins, for example, explains that social class, quote, encompasses a variety of other factors and determinants that than simply whether or not one owns the means of production. The general character of the relative instability of one's life, for example, access to education and the quality of it, access to a variety of consumer choices about housing, food, et cetera, end quote. This is true. In capitalist society, society, members of the working class are not only exploited, but they are often oppressed as well. Poor people are more likely to be incarcerated because of higher rates of policing in their neighborhoods. Poor people are often denied mortgages. Many aspects of the welfare system are highly punitive. But the problem with intersectionality is that it solely understood classism as a form of oppression analogous to other forms of oppression. Collins even defines oppression as the wider genus, with exploitation as just one mode or strategy of capital. Intersectionality is missing, therefore, the account of the structure of exploitation that perpetuates capitalism. Value dissociationism offers such an account, as well as providing a new way to understand how gender, race, and various other identity categories function in capitalism. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna try to introduce a few of the basic concepts of value disassociation theory, uh, developed in the context of the German New Marx readings of the 1960s and the associated value critique tradition or Wert critique. The theory of value disassociation, we argue, offers an important theoretical contribution to the ongoing debates regarding the relation between gender and capitalism. And specifically, we turn to the work of Roswitha Schultz, a key theorist in the, this tradition, for developing a dialectical analysis of gender and the gender division of labor. Uh, against the so-called orthodox tradition of Marxism and its class reductionist orientation, Schultz's theory of value dissociation grounds the systematic gender division of labor in the categories of political economy. Schultz draws from Marx's critique of political economy uh, uh, characterized by the indirect, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, which Marx grasps uh, as a form of uh, socialization that is different and unique uh, compared to past social forms and is characterized by the indirect domination of individuals by the categories of capital. Schultz conceptualizes the categories of labor, value, and the commodity as forms of socialization unique to capitalist society. These are not merely narrow economic categories, but are general forms that belong to uh, capitalist society. Exploitation uh, in this tradition is not the central category of capitalism, but is rather a part of the more fundamental problem of abstract domination. Value, in particular, is the fundamental form in which the indirect relations between individuals are mediated through the exchange of commodities. 
While Schultz, like uh, other feminist Marxists, acknowledges that Marx's critique of political economy is a necessary theoretical framework for grasping domination, she argues that Marx failed to grasp the status of women's reproductive labor in capitalism. For Schultz, value and abstract labor are insufficient concepts to account for how capitalism produces fetishized social relations when it comes to the gender division. Schultz introduces the concept of value dissociation, uh, or sometimes translated as value separation, to articulate the relation between value production and the gender division of labor. The key differences from other single systems theorists are that she does not argue that work predominantly performed by women in capitalism is value producing, as did wages for housework. Nor does she argue that reproductive labor simply creates use values or cheapens labor power, uh, as have other social reproduction theorists. Uh, both views see labor performed by women solely through the lens of value production, while Schultz offers the more capacious account of value disassociation. So value dissociation recognizes, as have other Marxist feminists, that labor power does not simply present itself as a natural or physical factor of production, but is in fact already mediated by commodity relations. The key factor in this mediation is female re reproductive labor or labor traditionally performed by women, often in the home. Capitalism, according to Schultz, quote, contains a core of female determined reproductive activities and affects, characteristics, attitudes that are dissociated from value and abstract labor, end quote. So the characteristically female reproductive activities of childcare and housework cannot be subsumed directly under the concept of labor, uh, even though reproductive labor does not represent a separate system as argued by the dual systems theorists. As Schultz suggests, reproductive labor is quote, a necessary aspect of value, yet it also exists outside of it and is for this very reason, it's precondition. So these reproductive activities, housework, childcare, and elder care, are key factors in the maintenance of the commodity of labor power, but are systematically cut off or dissociated from the production of value. For Schultz, value dissociation corresponds to a symbolic order of gender relations. Abstract, value-producing labor is associated with maleness, rationality, efficiency, and economy while femininity is associated typically with emotionality, sensuality, and female or motherly caregiving. So Schultz offers a genetic account of labor power and reproductive uh, labor. For Schultz, the identification of value producing labor with men and the corresponding identification of reproductive labor with women is not merely a pre-capitalist residue. Schultz cautions against seeing capitalism as simply an economic system that exploits pre-capitalist patriarchal relations, nor is her position that capitalism is accidentally sexist. Rather, she argues that while gendered relations predated capitalism, uh, in most men uh, occupied a hegemonic position that was largely symbolic, women were not relegated to a separate sphere. Uh, in past societies. So the stark dualism of masculinity and femininity, Schultz argues, arises with capitalist modernity. So the polarization of the genders in capitalism reflects the objective binarism of the commodity as a form of socialization. Unlike past societies, such as feudalism or slave modes of production, where, uh, which reproduce themselves through the direct oppression of specific social groups, Capitalism reproduces itself by way of the indirect exploitation of the wage labor system. The dual sided character of the categories of value, such as abstract labor and concrete labor, exchange value and use value, reflects the contradictory form of capital in which private individuals obtain their social character through the mediations of reified things, that is, commodity values. Within modern commodity producing society, pre-existing patriarchal divisions acquire ever more rigid determinations as they are mediated by the dual-sided uh, character of the categories of value. 
as Schultz claims, quote, politics and economics are associated with masculinity, with a male sexuality that posits itself as individualized, rational, and aggressive. Women, on the other hand, are typically reduced to their sexualized bodies or to the naturalized ensemble of traits associated with motherhood and reproduction. This gender division is not, of course, a symmetrical relation, but reflects the asymmetry of commodity production with its social attribution of masculinity with value production and labor, while women are relegated to the sphere of the dissociated unproductive laboring activities. Capitalism, in essence, is the gender of capitalism, to quote Schultz. So like intersectionality, the theory of value dissociation moves beyond narrow economistic explanations regarding the gender division of labor in traditional Marxism, which often explains away the gender division as a mere tool of capitalist exploitation. However, by focusing on the multiplicity of irreducible, heterogeneous oppressions, intersectionality theory, we argue, fails to grasp the totality as a universal social form and as the true object of critique. So rather than grasping capitalism as an ensemble of power relations that oppresses particular identities according to specific characteristics, the critique of value grasps capitalism as an indirect form of domination in which material relations between persons manifest as directly social relations among commodity values. It's important to understand that Schultz's concept of value dissociation does not simply refer to concrete empirical women who carry out unpaid domestic work. Schultz is not offering an empiricist analysis of what kind of labor produces wealth, but she instead shows how labor relations are a form structured by value, which has other social characteristics or predicates like gender or race. A critique of the gender division of labor and capitalism should not limit itself to an analytic description of categories of oppression and their complex perspectives, but it should aim to grasp the social genesis of categories that reduce particular individuals to functions of the universal. According to Schultz, value dissociation also represents a meta-theoretical framework that rejects the assumption that, quote, empirical male and female individuals correspond directly with the categories of value. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the categories of value and specific individuals. Men and women do not appear immediately as the effects of a static gender structure, but they are socialized indirectly by the overarching dissociation of value as the form determining principle of the social totality. So such a meta-theoretical perspective, we suggest, can account for the contradictory transformations regarding the status of the gender division throughout the uneven development of capitalism. Rather than grasping the concepts of value production as static fixed conditions, the theory of value dissociation conceptualizes society as a dialectic of essence and appearance, a relation of reproduction and transformation. As many have detailed, Transformations in the structure of global capitalism since the 1970s have facilitated the entry of women into more workplaces and have undermined the stability of women's relegation to the private sphere of the home. Despite the continued inequalities of income and security between men and women in work, women have been more integrated into abstract labor and the process of accumulation. So as a surface appearance then, neoliberalization and the erosion of the Fordist male breadwinner model have seemed to overcome classically patriarchal divisions between men and women. However, the integration of women into abstract labor and the corresponding functionalization of women as masculine, rational, and independent has not overcome capitalism's patriarchal dissociation of value on the conceptual plane, but has only subsumed women under more flexible patterns and institutions of gender domination. To analyze this phenomenon, Schultz refers to feminist sociologist Regina Becker-Schmidt, uh, whose concept of the double socialization of women accounts for the condition that many women now face, the dual burden of labor in the public sphere of the market on the one hand and reproduction in the family on the other. 
This can be, can be seen, for example, in the dual burden of double socialization faced by women integrated into labor markets in the OECD North, as well as by the rapid growth in number of women as proletarianized workers and informal economy workers in the South. So the status of male workers has similarly undergone a transformation as declines in the stability of the breadwinner model through offshoring, de-skilling, and flexibilization have pushed men into more competitive relations with women in labor markets. As already pre uh, precarious men have witnessed increases in their own superfluity, the neoliberal period has been characterized by defensive androcentric cultural prescriptions and violence, as well as by the most re recent efforts by the state to criminalize women's reproductive rights. Such transformations, however, do not imply the historical obsolescence of the categories of value, labor, and the commodity, but only mean that the process of value dissociation has moved behind the directly oppressive institutions of traditional patriarchy, such as the family, while preserving the essential dissociation of value through the double socialization of women, as more women are integrated into abstract mediation of labor. Direct and overt relations of gender depression now appear more diffu uh, diffuse and fluid, and by implication, less binding. But the indirect relations of value remain intact as the condition of society's continued gender hierarchy. The theory of value dissociation, we argue, can grasp processes of change regarding the gender division of labor in a manner that moves beyond critiques of gender inequality, as well as intersectional theories which analyze the relationality of oppressed identities. The Marxist value disassociation perspective is both a critique of the categories of political economy and a critique of the symbolic order of the gender hierarchy. So just to briefly conclude, um, we hope to have shown that value disassociationism offers an improvement over traditional Marxism, dual systems theories, uh, several six single systems theories and feminist intersectionality. By severing capital and patriarchy into two supposedly separate spheres, dual systems theorists fail to grasp reproductive labor as an historically specific form determination of capitalist modernity. Similarly, single systems theorists, which posit the unity of capital and patriarchy, fail to conceptualize the mediation of value and reproductive labor, subsuming women's labor into the undifferentiated system. Interna uh, intersectionality theory sees capitalism as an assemblage of power relation rather than a structure of abstract domination. When it accounts for exploitation, it sees it in relation with other oppressions, but often fails to conceptualize the function of exploitation within the more fundamental principle of domination, namely domination by value. Value disassociation theory, by contrast, moves beyond the empirical level of analysis of patriarchy's relation to capital by conceptualizing the social form of women's labor dialectically as an imminent moment within a contradictory social dynamic that structures the relations of capitalist modernity. Um, and with that, uh, I, th I think we can we can stop there. We we have um, certainly more to say, and also possible limits um, to the perspective Schultz introduces in mind. Um, but we'd be interested in in your thoughts at this point, or whatever feedback or criticisms. Um, we're all ears since we we see this as a work in progress. But thank you. Okay, so uh, if you are watching us live on Facebook, please do submit questions for the q and A. I already have um, one question which comes in, and maybe it will help us to really begin to conceptualize what you mean by valued association um, and also kind of where women's work fits in. So the question is about the lumpen proletariat, and it asks, um, are they the quote disassociated? or dissociated, and uh, what do they produce? Uh, how do they relate to this sort of broader framework of dissociationism, especially also through this question of the uh, gender division of labor? So or if you all would like to start, I guess, by addressing that question, um, then we can move on from there. 
my inclination is no, they are not the dissociated. Um, but I think that um, that's not what she means by the dissociated, but I haven't thought at all about their relation to the dissociated or the, um, because I think that they're this category, you know, outside of the reserve labor army for Marx, and it can include both, you know, um, women and men. And, um, and so as of course, do both the reproductive and the productive spheres. What do you think, Charlie? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, my, my understanding would be, um, the relation of value production within abstract labor to the disassociated is a more fundamental distinction. Uh, and the disassociated sphere of women's work is really um, private work within the home that uh, capital kind of abstracts from out of, I, I think in their understanding, the lumpen proletariat or displaced workers or the unemployed would be, um, Kind of a determination within that broader conceptual distinction. Um, we, we should also say, and we didn't really have time uh, for this, but uh, what one aspect of their Marxism that's totally central is the theory of crisis. Um, and so certainly it's their understanding in terms of political economy that capitalism will create a more and more sur uh, uh, obsolete or sur uh labor force. Uh, with a wider, wider lump in pro proletariat. Um, all right, so I kind of want to move forward here with the next question. Um, and I think this was slightly polemical, but fun anyway, so it'd be nice to uh, to respond to. And the question is, does referring to classical Marxism or traditional Marxism see too much ground to critiques which are often based on uh, caricature rather than serious engagement with Marx or the history of Marxism? Um, and here uh, he refers to Engels and, and the book on the family, uh, which seems to go far beyond what many people would, would often mean when they talk about so-called traditional or historical Marxism. Charlie, yeah. it's Larry. I don't know if you're looking at the question. <laughs> Larry who sent this question. Yes. Um, there are traditional Marxisms. It would be more, far, more fair to say, certainly. Uh, and the Engelsian tradition certainly at an empirical level goes much further in uh, analyzing the, the role of gendered work and the gender division of, of, of labor. I think in essence, what the value critical perspective is taking issue with um, from within this, let's say generically lumped together uh, tradition of, of traditional Marxism would be a kind of ontologization of labor and an affirmative position of a kind of unified industrial proletariat that would reclaim the products of, of wealth and redistribute it fairly. So um, I, I think uh, most of Engels is guilty of that kind of worldview, that kind of scientific socialism that um, essentially views capital as a determinate uh, unfolding of different phases of accumulation. Um, I don't know, Sarah, if you wanted to tweak that. Um, certainly there are tendencies within all these critiques of Marx that straw men, traditional Marxism. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, we had that conversation when we were talking about some of, you know, how we say that how intersectionality moves beyond some kind of class reductionist accounts, but we think that most Marxists worth their, worth their salt are moving beyond this as well. Um, and that wasn't Marx's account. Um, and so I think that, you know, we had this conversation um, as we were, as we were doing this, and of course, and I think that the feminist tradition has in, in often straw manned Marx um, and, and taken a couple, you know, key contributions or key things um, from Marx and or from like a Lukashian Marx in terms of standpoint epistemology, um, you know, from an idea of class consciousness, um, but without directly engaging with Marx itself. Um, but I think that the feminists that we deal with, you know, are, are much more sensitive to the Marxist tradition. Um, so I kind of want to take the uh, chair's prerogative for a moment and and let myself ask the question. Uh, but you know, I guess the other thing I, I, I want to do is is ground us a little bit more in the concrete. At least for me, this has been a, a, a very enjoyable and interesting conversation, but one that's 
been very sort of abstract. So I kind of just want to land us in some concrete realities. Um, one of those realities is, you know, you, you mentioned femi the feminization of uh, the workforce in, in, in the sort of sense of the value producing labor force, right? And I think that's one aspect, but that's, that's a trend. Another trend is a different kind of feminization, which is what we, you know, the feminization of work itself, we might say. So for example, the rising importance of the service economy, um, you know, the commodification of childcare, of elder care, the rise of fast food as a sort of industry. I mean, we can go through all of these various ways in which, um, reproductive labor has itself been integrated into um, value or reproductive work has itself been integrated into value production. So I guess it, just to help me conceptualize what you're saying and also to understand this, this other kind of feminization of work that's happening, could you kind of respond to that and explain how it fits within this question of value dissociation? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I, one of the, one of the, challenges of, of Marxist feminism is accounting for the moments of social reproduction that are truly dynamic and are altering the relations of commodity production, but to also account for the ways in which what is static and unchanging is preserved at, an, at a higher level of, of abstraction. Um, so it's true in the neoliberal OECD North, you have a kind of um, I like the way you put it, a kind of direct um, introduction or infusion of reproductive labor into, into work, into wage labor. And that's part of this wider story of a kind of flexibilization of labor. Um, but I, I, I think what value dissociation would, would wanna hold fast to is that um, really uh, at a higher conceptual level of analysis, you still have to, um, think about uh, the immense kind of growth of uh, laboring activities that has to remain severed from value production as its constitutive ground. Uh, and, and um, you know, I, th I think um, one thing that's, that's hard to account for is uh, the manner in which uh, these two activities are bleeding together. Um, but if, if they have bled together so fully, um, I, th I think the analysis becomes kind of lose, loses focus. I mean, I still think that uh, capital is essentially a system of exploitation um, of labor power. And I still think it relies on an abstraction from woman, women's unpaid work at, at some level. I don't know, Sarah, if you wanted to, to amend that or... No, um, not, not to amend that, um, that with, you know, a lot of people doing um, sociological accounts of, of labor difference, and they talked about the, the second shift work, and that's what reproductive labor theorists have been talking about for years, right, um, work that's done at home. And now there's been discussion of what people are calling the third shift, and that's accounting for affective labor, emotional labor, um, remembering when the kid's teacher's birthday is, or I don't know if kids, people, teachers get birthday presents, but that they get something and that, that there's like, you know, remembering of all the birthdays in the family. And I think that um, despite women's entry into very, into most all workspaces and, and often traditionally very masculine workspaces, we still have this kind of dissociated work. Um, the work of um, of the of the emotional work, the work of the family that is relegated more and more to women, and even when men are doing it, it remains feminized. Um, and of course, Marx still already provides for when reproductive activities are value producing, right? And so, like you know, your the restaurant um, is feeding people, and that's producing value. Um, uh, in a way that, you know, a private cook doesn't, or, you know, your, um, your mother's cooking is not doing. Um, and I think that what you say about, about this blurring or of more men entering into a more feminized workspace is also something that Schultz discusses when she talks about what she calls the feralization of patriarchy. And so she, she's talking about how, you know, we have 
have this dissociated um, sphere that we've kind of pushed you know, actual women into and certain types of labor into. Um, but then with the kind of erosion of the of the Fordist model and moving into some other types of models, there's been a huge backlash by men who got some type of benefit um, from, you know, uh, from occupying the, the gender of capitalism. Um, and as that is happening, you know, to fewer empirical men, I think that there is, um, this has, you know, really deleterious effects, um, you know, in, in the paper, um, you know, we obliquely or quickly reference, you know, um, women's reproductive rights, but I think that we're seeing this with the attack on Roe, um, you know, we're seeing uh, um, a certain type of masculinity that's, that's just going wild. Mm -hmm. um, so something you said then, I just want to clarify and see if I if I understood it, Sarah, and and then I, I promise I'll get away from my question at least for a moment. But uh, it, it seemed to me that part of what you're suggesting. So we've got second shift and third shift uh, work, but then also in terms of this dissociation, you have kind of in the workplace the value producing workplace. So this geographic division is in some ways collapsing. That is to say that you can be doing second shift, third shift work while actually at your value producing workplace. And so that that the the sort of geography that you started with of sort of housework, domestic labor, the private sphere, and then the kind of work that you're doing in some geographically distinct workplace. I mean, we see this with the idea of, of me of work from home, but I guess the the, the you know the, the the flip side would be home from work or something. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, if you if you want to sort of speak to that, Sarah, that'd be helpful just so I cl can clarify and understand. No, I think that that's, I think that that's right on. I think that we're seeing that, um, you know, that happening all the time. Um, but, and I think that we just, I think that we've often thought that gender um, differences are, you know, have been a lot more stable than they are and that capitalism takes them up and uses them to its advantages. Well, sure, but like to what extent are the gender relations that we have now created by capitalism? Um, and I think that that is something that Schultz does a really good job in saying. And then even when we have, you know, men working from home and women working from home and empirical women, you know, in all of these different positions, we still have this, I, this kind of these creations of, of of really normative gender positions. Charlie, help me out a little. Clear up well, I would just add um, one area that she finds useful or one, one thinker she finds useful I mentioned was Regina Becker-Schmidt uh, and the idea of double social socialization, right? Which I talked about and that has to do with the idea that for, for many women, you are now tasked with directly market mediated activities in work and not so market mediated activities at home. We can maybe treat this as triple socialization now with, with, with the third shift. Um, so in a way, empirical women have to kind of carry out a synthesis within themselves between these disassociated spheres. Um, and this, rep, this is a really acute form of gendered alienation. I think that that is ongoing. Um, we still have more work to do on, on the actual um, details of, of the dual socialization story. Um, but I, I find that a particularly useful model in thinking about, yeah, this appearance of fluidity and this, appear, this it is a reality of, of, you know, the kind of boundaries between the private and the public life, you know, melting away. Um, so we have to theorize that melting away within the context of a social, a social totality that still is reproducing its fundamental forms, its forms of life. So uh, one of the questions, I'm not sure that I understand it, but I'm gonna try and, and paraphrase it to get, give at least some, so my conception of what it's asking is about, do, are there examples of converging value systems? And I, I almost hear that as like a utopian question or, or question about the utopian possibility of, of moving beyond dissociation to Reassociate, so to speak, these things that have been separated or pulled apart. Um, but you know, we've been talking about kind of pathological forms of 
of of integration? Are there sort of non pathological ways that uh, that you, that you see for this kind? I mean, how are you theorizing? I guess a revolutionary possibility here. Well, you have to ask Larry for that one. <laughs> jokes, jokes. Um, um, I think that I want to go with Marx here and say that we have to be um, relatively silent about you know most of what would happen in the in a communist future. However, that question asker talks about sustainability in the question. Um, and I, I've, you know, I've been very interested in ecofeminism, and I think that the important critiques that we have now are Marxist ecofeminist critiques. I think that, um, you know, I think that, and this kind of goes some way. Like I'm cheating. I'm looking at the what the other question was about intersectionality. I think that, you know, like theoretical accounts that see the connection between the degrade degradation of the more than human world and women and people of color um, and, and all of us um, is, are, are really connected. Um, and so I think that our account, yeah, I think that this question asker says something important when we need to be, um, that um, we should be asking what this Marxist feminist account says about, um, about the environment as well. Yeah, one area I'm, I'm I'm starting to think about is uh, in terms of Marxist feminism um, that what could be useful about this critique or you know for Marxist feminists in general would be to develop a really uh, really clear sided critique of liberal feminisms that essentially want greater entry into capitalist relations that want further entrenchment in the abstract labor processes. Um, now it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, it's kind of difficult terrain to navigate because um, one simply can't be advocating for not, you know, for gender inequity or something like this, but we, we need a, a real sharp critique of abstract labor, of labor in general, as a principle that is dominating. Um, so I think Marxist feminism would do well to, to orient itself around um, a kind of politics of anti-work. Uh, and to, to really develop, uh, you know, different perspectives that uh, actually are not wanting greater entry, but are critical of the, of the domination by work in general on a, on a global level. Yeah, so actually, with respect to that final question that you were alluding to, um, Sarah, and I'm, I'm, I kind of would, I might come back to the anti-work thread that just got laid out there because that's very interesting. But for me, that's very, very interesting. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think there, that there's, um, what they're asking is important because I know for, among other things, for example, uh, you know, one of the criticisms that I think is re relatively canonical coming from uh, intersectional feminism would be that, um, even the very concept of like leaving the home to work is both classed and uh, raced. That is to say that the experience of, of working class black women was never one in which they were merely or primarily uh, e exclusively consigned to the domestic sphere. And to the extent that that was true, it wasn't even their own home. That is to say the work that they would be doing might be um, as maids in the homes of um, uh, of white women, for example, who were entering into that abstract, <laughs> in, entering into that labor force, right? Uh, that value creating labor force. So, you know, I guess I wonder, you, you've explored, I guess, the, the intersection or given an account to some extent of the, the way that you would treat the intersection between uh, gender and class, but how to think then if we add that added layer of intersectionality and want to talk about race, gender, class all together in, you know, one voice, or is that not possible? Do we have to go back to a dual systems theory where we've got something like gender class over here, right, as one single system, but race over here running sort of separately from it as, a, as an independent track. So I guess I'm sure this is a huge problem and not one that you can solve right now in five or 10 minutes, but you know, could, could you at least uh, sort of you know, tell me a little bit about what you're thinking when you, when you propose this kind of question? Well, um, capitalism 
has its has deep, deep origins with anti-Black racism. And so the kind of primitive accumulation um, that that capitalism rests on, um, the kind of original theft, the original non-capitalist, non-fair and equal exchange that Marx talks about, um, a huge part of it was the Atlantic slave trade. And I think that, no, we don't want another set of two tracks where racism is, is somewhere separate or, or we look at racism as something simply attitudinal. Um, but I think that it requires an analysis that we haven't done yet. And we've had definitely had this conversation um, about how I think that I think that, and you know, I think that some Schultz does some work on this too, but it hasn't been translated. So she says, you know, okay, right here, I'm talking about my work on gender, but see this book where I talk more about race and, and um, other forms of, of oppression and exploitation. So yeah, I think, and I think that that's, yeah, you're right on there, that that work has to be done. And, and this is something that we've been looking towards doing or towards at least thinking about. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we both, you know, totally agree that intersectionality theory represents a really tremendous advance over a number of, of discourses for um, bringing into conceptual, you know, consideration the historical processes by which capital accumulation is related in a very essential way with systems of racism. Um, and so, yeah, moving forward, I mean, uh, I think we have to conceptualize racism as an essential determination of capitalist accumulation, not an accidental uh, or merely contingent um, collision with, with an otherwise ideal system that emerged. Um, where it would actually be placed uh, conceptually vis-a-vis -vis the value disassociation stuff on gender, uh, we haven't fully articulated yet. Um, um, again, I, I think primitive accumulation would be the place for us to think about it, to think about it as an ongoing process of displacement and dispossession as central to accumulation. And I, the reason we've turned to intersectionality is because, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that you said something just like this just now, that it's the it's an improvement on so much of liberal and radical feminism. Um, and so if we want to think about, you know, who is valued associationism, and so they, you know, Schultz talks some about deconstructivist feminists, and it seems at some point she might be talking about possibly different feminists. And so she is, she does have some feminist in her mind, and she's not engaging directly with intersectionality. Um, but um, I think that you know, by and large, and, and I and I hope you guys agree that like we don't want non-intersectional feminisms. Um, that we think that like feminine, you know, feminism should be intersectional. Um, and that is like a, has been a great movement and a, you know a, a great contribution. And so like, okay, what does that have to say about about capitalism and can these things come you know together? And so I don't think we want to have the system where yeah, value dissociation needs some wins and we need to throw out the contributions of intersectionality. That's not what we want to argue. Yeah, I, I would I would just um, you know because we were kind of covering a lot of ground quickly, I would just say the one difference we do have with intersectionality theory as we understand it um, is that in, in many discussions, there's a tendency to um, either conflate, uh, separate or fail to ground the difference between oppression and exploitation within capitalist modernity. Um, you know, Oppression, as Sarah pointed out, is a direct oppression. Um, slavery, it's a direct oppression of one person owning another person. Marx's kind of contribution or critique of political economy was to show that really accumulation occurs through precisely an equal and voluntary exchange. It is a system premised on surplus value production occurring in a fair and equal exchange. So you know, we have to, I think, hold these categories apart. And that, if we want to speak to some traditional Marxisms, is uh, is something that I think that um, 
um, some potential interpretations or traditional Marxisms get wrong um, when they focus more on the theft of labor power. Right. Um, that the workers, you know, being, um, and that's not what Marx says, and, and that's not as helpful to understand um, capitalism. I mean, one thing that what you just and I don't know if we're at 506, I should say. So let me just say if, you, if you're all okay for another one more question, we can do that. Or if you think it's time, time to go. Um, and just let me then turn to the okay, I don't see anything on Facebook right now. So I think we're good for me to follow up this question. Um, you know, sort of an interesting moment happens. And this is me just sort of framing this to see what you think about it. But uh, I, I tend to teach. Um, Fre uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And there's a really sort of interesting moment where, um, you know, he's sort of uh, moving into wage labor, right? And at first he's moving into wage labor in such a way that he remains a slave uh, to his master and therefore has to turn his wages over directly. Eventually, you know, they, they reach some kind of agreement where he's able to keep some of his wage. And then, you know, finally, of course, emancipation results in him becoming uh, a wage worker. Um, I wonder if there's a way to talk about, I guess, those those different moments and how, how so to speak, his labor, I mean, the, it sounds to me anyway, like this story has a space for this dissociation theory, right? That there's there's a way to see what, what where the dissociation occurs almost <laughs> physically within the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, but but maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. So I just want to turn it over to you and see if, if that's like a space where we can talk about race and racialization and, um, you know, the, the way that you might begin to construct, I guess, such a, a viewpoint. That's really interesting. I mean, I'm inclined to think that moving forward, um, a disassociationist account of race would really have to um, mobilize kind of the historical processes by which capitalism was internally mediated with with slavery, with the system that that preceded it in a way and was concurrent with it. Um, and I'm inclined to to think of racism and attitudes of sexism to degree as kind of um, ways in which the emergence of a system of competitive wage labor produced kind of fetishized interpretations of individuals as atomized and separate from one another and easily subsumable into determinate identities. Um, and, and we're really trying to think through kind of the key contradiction of capitalism as a mediated ab system of abstract domination that takes on these very concrete uh, direct appearances, but the appearances are very confused and very um, uh, kind of um, that there's a tendency in which everyone can uh, only see the comp competition between individuals over value rather than these underpinning structural categories. Um, clearly, it's an opening and, you know, that we have to think through moving forward, but um, yeah, thinking about kind of a transition between slavery and wage labor might be a, a place to go. I was muted. Sarah, anything you want to add before we uh, sign off? Okay, well, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I think it was really uh, quite enlightening. Um, I think you've already got not only a bunch of questions, but a great deal of praise on Facebook. So please do visit there and uh, continue to engage with your uh, interlocutors. We thank everybody for viewing. And again, uh, thank you so much, Sarah and Charles. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. See everybody next month. It's a pleasure. <laughs>